As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a naturalist. <laughs> You guys get it. To me, to be a naturalist was better than being president of the United States. To me, to be a natural historian, a scientist of nature, was to be on top of the world. Even before I first wandered into the American Museum of Natural History for an internship, I knew I wanted to be part of them. It was there that I knew I belonged. I mean, they were different from everybody else. They got to do whatever they wanted. They went around the world, seeing things no one had ever seen, in places no one had ever been. I mean, there was Theodore Roosevelt hunting big game in Africa, bringing back the heads and horns to the Smithsonian and the Bronx Zoo. There was Charles Darwin sailing along the southern oceans, studying fossils and finches, and discovering evolution and natural selection. And there was Sylvia Earle diving to the very bottom of the ocean, discovering that those deepest, darkest depths are actually full of light. Today, I want to tell you about natural history in the 21st century. I think many people think of us natural historians like the many dinosaurs that populate the museums that we work in. But I'm here to tell you that natural history is vibrant and evolving, just like the life that we study. This is the first scientist. The first scientist was a natural historian. He wrote on the parts of animals, on the history of animals, and on the generation of animals. Now, science has changed a lot since our early days with Aristotle, but natural historians today are still keen observers of the wild, as Aristotle taught us to be. Why does a batfish walk? How does a spinner dolphin spin? Why are people the way we are? But now natural historians are using MRIs and CT scanners and whole genome sequences to better understand our Earth. Right now, we're across the street from LSU's Museum of Natural Science, one of the most active research museums in the world. And that's our laboratory. We have students and curators, going around the world, discovering new and exciting things. Our herpetology group discovered the world's smallest vertebrate, this tiny frog from Papua New Guinea. It's about the size of a bee. Our mammologist helped describe a new species of hero shrew from West Africa. This thing's yay big, but can withstand the weight of a human being standing on top of it. It's got some crazy vertebrae. It's very strong. And uh, my little contribution, the pancake batfish, this might look like the hero shrew after someone stood on top of it, but it's a, <laughs> it's a little flattened anglerfish just off the coast of Louisiana. But maybe that's the stuff you know about us already, right? The Indiana Jones stuff, going to a strange place, bringing back strange things. But we do more than that. We've been doing collections and curations for centuries, but natural history museums now have modern research labs with 21st century technology. That's the envy of any biology lab in the country. And I think most people don't see that when they walk into a typical natural history museum. You see these displays, most of them are static, there's some dead animals. But these are just meant to be little windows into a much broader world. And that broader world starts right behind the scenes. Behind the scenes are our collections, and there can be millions of artifacts and specimens here. These are the libraries of the Earth's biodiversity. And we're not just keeping these jars on a shelf full of dead animals. We're studying them through and through. We want to know about their bones, their skins, their guts, their DNA, their RNA. We want to know who is related to whom to better understand their evolutionary history and our own. Each species is a page in this great evolutionary textbook. Each species that we lose is a page that's torn out that can never be read again, keeping our story incomplete. And we're not stamp collectors collecting for the sake of collecting. We want to better understand how to protect these organisms by studying them. We want to protect them and conserve them from pollution and over-harvesting and overfishing. I can tell you since the 2010 Gulf of Mexico oil spill, there's some species that we haven't seen since in the subsequent five years. There's some species that were there before the spill and not after. And we know that because of museum records. We need, that, we need these museums to be the biodiversity hub and the record keeper of where things were and where they've gone. Now, this biodiversity doesn't just tell us about the present or the most recent times. It can tell us about deep Earth history. A lot of my work is in fresh waters in Central America. Central America is a strange place, this little land bridge connecting North and South America. It's actually composed of multiple land masses that came together in this strange arrangement over millions of years. 
And the freshwater fishes on these, because they're stuck in lakes and rivers and don't usually venture off into the oceans, can tell us about when populations connected between these land masses. And so, in their DNA, there are little clues about how these land masses came together and when. I'll give you an extreme example of how uh, biology can tell us about Earth history. Organisms that live in caves are really well adapted to them. These are really dark environments, very stable, no hurricanes or, or snowstorms here. But the animals in them are so well adapted that they've often lost eyes, pigmentation. They've also often lost the fear of any predators, like these cave fishes, which I can sometimes pick up with my bare hands without a net. That's why we are surprised that these so adapted fishes um, that can't really venture out into the oceans or even five feet out of the caves, that we discover that the cave fishes in Australia are most closely related to cave fishes in Madagascar. We thought, how can this be? They can't possibly get out of these systems. And yet 6,000 kilometers away are their closest relatives. What we found is that when we looked at their DNA, that their molecular clock, the amount of changes in their DNA, amounted to them being separated for over 120 million years old. That means that these guys didn't move anywhere. It was the continents that moved. Australia and Madagascar were part of this larger landmass called Gondwana, and that's where these things were first, before they separated. And that's an example of how biology can not just tell us about um, other fields, but uh, things like geology as well. So in the 17th century, science was 17th century science and 17th century collecting. Natural historians today are still doing that kind of 17th century collecting, but now we're doing 21st century science, everything from genomics to geophysics. But we stay true to our oldest traditions. We're connecting that present of science to the most ancient times. So we still ask, like Aristotle, what is out there? Or like Darwin, what are our origins? And sometimes, like Teddy, you know, is somebody going to shoot that? <laughs> we do study lots of dead animals, after all. But the naturalists themselves will never die. And that's because as long as there's science and as long as there's nature, there'll be natural historians connecting the two. So, thank you very much. <laughs>